بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الواحد المنعم والصلاة والسلام على محمد سيد الأنام وعلى آله الكرام وصحبه العظام وسلم تسليما كثيرا ما دام يجري هذا النظام وبعد قال تبارك وتعالى وعاشروهن بالمعروف وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم استوصوا بالنساء خيرا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والصلوات والتسليمات Respected brothers, elders, mothers, sisters, and youngsters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, sustainer, cherisher, and nourisher, and we send the choicest blessings upon the final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings upon him. There are many social issues and challenges that we as a community face. In fact, not only as a community, but as a global human nation, there are so many challenges, so many social challenges that we face and we issue. These issues that we face, they are tremendous and they're multiple. As an imam, many people come to me looking for some sort of guidance, some sort of instructions, etc. It may relate to spirituality and fiqh, religious questions. It may uh, relate to youth issues, many times family issues. In some cases, drugs and alcohol. So there are a whole set of social issues that are faced by communities. Today I would like to address one major social issue, and that is domestic violence. And in particular, domestic violence against women and girls. And I wouldn't be exaggerating if I say that whenever I am contacted, 70% of the time it's related to family and marital problems. 70% of the time when I'm contacted to address certain matters as an imam, it's related to family or marriage. And in many of these cases, there is abuse. In many of these cases, there is insult. In many of these issues and these cases, there are anger management issues. So this is a real problem. Never, you know, has a time come upon the Muslim nation where we see this on a very large scale. So this is a real problem. It exists. Some time ago, a brother came to me and he says, do you issue letters? And I say, what do you mean issue letters? Then uh, we sat down and he said, you know what? I abused my wife. The matter went to court and I've been going through all these sessions of anger management, etc. And now the court has instructed that I need to go see a religious leader, have 12 sessions with this religious leader. And then after these 12 sessions about what the religion says about anger and about violence, then that imam, that clergy, that minister of religion is to issue a document saying that, you know, uh, you went through these sessions with your religious leader. So I said, I can't write the letter unless you take these 12 sessions with me, or else I would be lying, doing injustice. So these are real problems. They exist in our community. They are present. And we cannot hide behind the wall or shove the matter under the carpet. We have to address it. We have to talk about it. Wallahu la yastahi min al haq. Many matters, the Sahaba, the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, they were embarrassed to talk about. They were not upfront. But Allah revealed the verse of the Quran and said, Wallahu la yastahi min al haq. Allah is not embarrassed about telling you the truth. And Allah will instruct what to do in every case so that we may solve these problems so that we may resolve to address them and change for the better. So this is not an issue that is specific to Muslims. Don't get me wrong here. This is not an issue, domestic violence, violence against uh, women and girls. It's not specific to the Muslim community. This goes across the board. It goes across the religions in all kinds of communities, in different parts of the world. It, it, it is prevalent. It is there. And according to the organization, which is an offshoot organization of the White Ribbon Campaign, 
The White Ribbon Campaign is the largest organization as a grassroot level, on a grassroot level of men coming together to end violence against women and girls. So an offshoot organization of this by some of our community members, they established an organization called Muslims for White Ribbon. Muslims for right white ribbon. So we equally participate and say we don't want to see violence against women, against girls. So they've presented a few facts so that the imams could share with the community, so that the organizations, they can understand what's happening on a general level in Canada. So some of these facts. In Canada, every six days, a woman is killed because of domestic violence every six days in Canada. And on any given day in Canada, there are 3,000 women with their children leaving their homes to look for shelter, escaping and fleeing from domestic abuse. Domestic abuse and domestic violence. Over 60% of average Canadians say that they know at least one woman, if not more, they know at least one woman who, is, who was assaulted and who has been abused. 40,000 men are arrested every year in Canada for abuse and domestic violence. So this is a problem, this is real. This is something that exists. This is on a general level and for sure Muslims are also part of this. Right? We can't hide the problem, we need to address it. Now the question is why, you know, those who are experts, they will tell you exactly why an abuser abuses. What's the reason? What causes and incites violence, an insult or injury to another human being? But in general cases, they say that a person who is going under stress, they're frustrated. And specifically when it comes to men, and there's no bias here, there's no you know, discrimination that I'm trying to put here, I'm a male myself. But specifically when it comes to men, they have a sense of authority, or they feel a sense of power over women. And when one is unable to address the matter, this person becomes more frustrated and becomes more emotional. Now they're unable to communicate how to address the problem, so they express themselves instead of words, they are expressing themselves with violence, by beating someone, by using bad language, by abusing someone, by causing harm, injury, insults. So their communication is violence, it's not words. Now when we open the books of history, when we open and we open the pages all the way back to the time of the Prophet peace and blessings upon him, we find that this type of injustice was the order of the day. So there was oppression. Those who were strong and who had power, who had authority, they had muscle, they were the macho. They would feel that we can do anything. We can exploit the weak. We can overtake the resources of the poor. And this was the order of the day, it was normal. So the poor, the weak, the vulnerable, the children, the women of society, they would be in such a position where they would have no relief. So it was the order of the day. The Prophet, peace and blessings upon him as the Messenger of Allah, was sent with the revelation, with Qur'an, to change this landscape, to change the oppression to justice, to change harshness, from harshness to kindness and gentleness. And this is why when we study the life of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, in Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah summarizes it. Allah says in one verse, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings upon him, as a mercy to all the worlds. So ask ourselves, what kind of society did the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, want to establish? What kind of families did the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, want to see? If we study the life of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, we will understand that the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, wanted to get rid of harshness, 
He wanted to remove injustice. He wanted to remove insult, injury, and abuse. And he wanted to establish kindness and gentleness. He wanted to establish char character and morals. He wanted to establish peace in societies, in communities, and in families. And this is why when the order of the day was oppression, the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, stood tall. And he said, A person who oppresses, understand that this will lead to tremendous darknesses on the day of judgment. When the order of the day was that orphans would be put aside, they would not be taken care of, widows were thrown to aside, they were regarded as the ills of society. The Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, stood up amongst the people and he declared, Ana wa kafilul yatimi kahatain. The Prophet ﷺ said, I and the person who takes care of that weak orphan will be like this in Jannah. And he joined his fingers together. When, when oppression was the order of the day and insult, abuse, intimidation was so prevalent that it was at every corner and nook of the societies, the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, went amongst the people and he said, لا يحل لمسلم أن يروع مسلما It is not permissible for a believer to insult, to intimidate another believer. When the people said that strength is being macho, is using vulgar language, it's showing authority, the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, indicated, he suggested, what you see strength in, there's weakness in it. And what you see weakness in, there is strength in it. And subhanallah, he said the profound words, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالسُرْعَةِ He said, strength is not that you are able to wrestle someone down, that you abuse someone, that you speak bad language to someone. That's not strength. لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالسُرْعَةِ to wrestle someone down is not strength. That's not being macho. The Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ If a person is angered, he's able to control his emotions. He's able to have a grasp on what he is saying. What a person is, how a person is behaving. They're able to control themselves in that rage, in that anger. That is true strength. That's what the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, said. That is the strong individual who is able to control their tongue, who's able to control their hands, who's able to control their emotions of rage and anger. And they don't insult, they don't abuse, they don't get violent. This is a person, this is a man of strength. So, what you see strength in, that is not strength. That's what he told the people. And what you see weakness in, it is in reality strength. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said that helping the orphan, helping the widow, helping those who suffer will take a person very high. مَن تَوَاضَعَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعُهُ اللَّهِ A person who humbles themselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate their portfolio, will elevate their status. Aqra ibn Habis radiallahu anhu came in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam jalisan inda rasulillah. He was seated in the presence of the Messenger, peace and blessings upon him. Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu an, his daughter's son, came in his presence. He was a young lad, he was a young child. The Prophet ﷺ embraced him. And the Prophet ﷺ kissed him. Qabbala Hassan ibn Ali. The Prophet ﷺ kissed Hassan, the son of Ali radiallahu an. And Aqra ibn Habis' jaw just dropped. And he was amazed, he was shocked. He said, you kiss these children? Li al ashara min al walad. I have ten children, and I have never kissed any of these ten children. So we understand the culture of that day. The culture of the day was to be macho. You can't smile. To be macho, you don't go down and you don't talk to a child. To be to be someone of authority, you don't have this gentleness in your life. So the Prophet ﷺ just stared at him for a few moments. The Prophet ﷺ just stared at him. The narration is of Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ stared at Aqra ibn Habis for a few moments. 
And he didn't know what to say. I'm kissing a child, this is mercy. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he completed the discussion by saying, مَن لَا يُرْحَمْ مَن لَا يُرْحَمْ لَا يُرْحَمْ A person who does not show mercy will not be entitled to mercy. A person who does not show mercy will not be entitled to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the order of the day was, the prevalent strength of that time was to show this authority, to abuse, to think lower of the vulnerable. But the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to establish a society where he wanted to see everyone at peace. No one feels threatened. No one feels that my life or my honor will be taken away. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to establish a beautiful society. Inna Allah rafiqun yuhibbur rifq. The Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, said, Allah loves gentleness. Inna Allah rafiqun. Allah loves, Allah is gentle and He loves gentleness. He wanted a society with gentleness, with character, with morals, with dignity, with responsibility and kindness to spread. That's the kind of families he wanted to establish. So we follow the Messenger وسلم, when it comes to many other aspects. So we'll ask, you know, Imam, you know, where do I wash my elbow until? Is it, do I include the elbow or is it a little higher or is it a lower? Someone asks, you know what, well, I'm fasting. So the calendar says the timing is, is, is this is when suhoor ends. So do I finish at that time or 10 minutes earlier or do I wait for the adhan? Subhanallah, we have questions that come and people ask them genuinely to practice. So we're following the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the way we pray. Shaykh, just check my ruku, you know, is it, is it right? Is, am, am, am I standing straight or is there a problem? Where do I put my feet? How do I stand? How do I enter the masjid? People ask these questions. So we follow to the letter the Messenger ﷺ in all other aspects. But why is it that some of us don't follow the Messenger when it comes to the way he behaved with his spouses? The way he behaved with his children? The way he behaved with the people around him? Whether Muslim or non-Muslim? We need to get out of this notion where we fool ourselves and we think we are following the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but in reality, in other aspects, we are not. In many aspects, we are not. So in every aspect, we should try our best to follow the Messenger, peace and blessings upon him. And it really hurts me. Seriously, it really hurts me when sisters here come here into this masjid, and they make appointments, they come and see me, and they say, you know what? One sister came and really, she was trembling. She was shaking. What's wrong, sister? And the sister says, you know what? Don't ever tell my husband that I came here. I actually booked an appointment for a doctor. I went to see the doctor. And on the way back home, I'm coming to see you. And I, want, I have a request for you. What's the request? You know, address this matter that my husband, I love my husband, but his language is so bad when he talks to me. He treats me like a rag. And I said, no, let me talk because we, we need to talk. We need to address the issue. Let me call your husband. Let me set up a time. He said, no, 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 don't do that. I'll be murdered alive. These are her words. I'll be murdered alive. It really hurts me. It really hurts me. And what does the sister say? He's here majority of the time for every prayer. You know, I, I feel fearful for this person. That this person is standing and humbling himself before the Creator, but is unable to humble himself before whom Allah has instructed to humble and work mutually with. The narration is very clear of Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, said, Inna Allah yu'adhibu yawm al qiyamah, alladheena yu'adhibuna al nasa fi dunya. Allah will punish that person who tortures human beings in this world. A person who tortures, who hurts, who, you know, uh, abuse is not only physical, it is emotional, it is verbal. And many times, the verbal abuse, it hurts more than the physical abuse. So the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, said this person will be tortured on the Day of Judgment because this person is torturing in this world. You know, I'm, I, I'm fearful that even... How can this person be performing salah? How can this person even make sujood? Whereas this person is taking away the rights of someone else, abusing someone, getting violent. 
Another sister came, Wallahi. Another sister came, and this was just in the last two months. And she said, we had our first baby, and we've been married for a number of years, and all this time I've been under abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, all kinds of abuse. And she says, if the baby cries in the night, my husband gets up and he starts to beat me because the baby is crying. If I'm moving in my bed and he wakes up, then he begins to insult me. How can we stand before Allah when we take away the rights of the human being? When we take away the rights whom Allah says, the Prophet ﷺ says, Istawsu bin nisa'i khayra. The Prophet ﷺ says, I emphasize to listen to my advice. And what's the advice? He said, treat women well. He said, treat women well. Treat women well. And when did he say this? In Hajjatul Wada' In the final sermon, when this was his summary of his message, he's leaving, he's departing. And these are his final advices. He says, treat women properly. Treat them with dignity. They also have honor. So when the call of the day was to abuse them, to treat them like cattle, they would be traded like property was traded. They would be inherited. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, treat these women as a creation, valuable creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And treat them good. Istawsu bin nisa'i khayra. Treat them well. The Prophet ﷺ said, khiyarukum khiyarukum li nisa'ikum. The best of you are those. What did he say? Did he say those who pray? Those who give zakah, those who go for hajj. What did he say? خِيَارُكُمْ خِيَارُكُمْ لِنِسَائِكُمْ The best of you are those who are best to your women. The best of you are those who are best to your women. So how can we engage in abuse or, or, or violence when these are the words of the Messenger wasallam? So there are many consequences. We just mentioned a few in terms of spiritual consequences. But when we look at legal consequences, there are tremendous consequences. Uh, uh, I was just informed about a case where a brother, in an argument, he held the wrist of his wife. Just the wrist. And in her emotional state, the sister picked up the phone, called 911, and the police got involved. He was arrested. A restraining order was put on him. For three months, he didn't see the inside of his home. Just because of holding the wrist. And the police here, we know the law and the authority here is that once they are informed or told, once they are informed, they have no option but to take action. They have no option but to take action. So the, the, the wife wrote a letter saying that, you know, there's no abuse here. It was just, uh, you know, an argument. But for three months, he could not enter his home and he had to spend $5,000 in court-related charges to take the restraining order away. So by doing one small thing, it, 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 it resulted so much, wrong, uh, so much wrong, so much uh, you know, negative aspects. And when we look at some of the laws, if abuse takes place, if violence takes place in the presence of children, the CAS can come and take those children away. And those children are now in the homes of non-Muslims. And you have no access to them. So th th there are not only spiritual consequences, but legal consequences. So this is a problem. And many cultures that we come from, we have the sense of authority as men. And we want to justify some of our actions, inappropriate, injustice actions by the Qur'an, na'udhu billah. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to establish peace. He wanted to establish gentleness and kindness within families. So what do we need to do? Very quickly as I wrap up, what do we need to do? There's a principle in Islam, in fiqh, that جَلْبُ الْمَنَافِعْ وَدَفْعُ madar. We need to always do things that will give us benefit, and we need to stay away from doing those things that will cause harm. So by abusing, it causes so many consequences, so we need to stop. So the first thing that we need to do is recognize that this is a problem. If I have an anger problem, I need to recognize there's a problem with me. I'm unable to control my anger. If I have an abusive tongue and I insult, I humiliate, I need to recognize I have a problem. I need to recognize it. That's the first step. 
Number two is we need to seek help both whether we are the abuser, the perpetrator or we are the victim. We need to speak, we need to tell someone, tell a doctor, tell your neighbor, tell someone that you trust. Approach counselors, tell some community members. We cannot suffer in silence. And many times the abuser blames his violence on the victim. So the, the abuser feels ashamed. You know, many times the sisters come and they say, no, my husband will never come for counseling. He'll, never, he'll feel ashamed. There's nothing to feel ashamed of. If you have a problem, recognize it and you treat The likes of Umar. Umar radiallahu anhu. Such a man. But when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, he consulted with him. Allah commands, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Allah commands the Prophet ﷺ, consult with them. وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ Do counseling amongst yourselves. So we have to speak, we have to address the problem. And nowadays there are many resources. There's many Muslim counselors. You don't have to go to a counselor that you, you're not, you don't find suitable. You know, there are many counselors, their portfolio, their, their, their understanding, their, their values, they're very public, they're known. You can have a meeting before you even go to the counselor. And understand that this is a counselor who recognizes family values, who understands the importance of children, and understands the bond of marriage. These, these, these kind of uh, counselors are there. And many times I get calls from agencies here at the masjid. That, you know, we have a client that's a Muslim. And we want to understand some of the culture around Islam. What happens when this occurs? And what happens when that occurs? Can you write it down? Can you send me a fax? Can you send me a letter, an email? So these, these are people, they want to help. So there's a lot of help out there. So whether we are the victims, we cannot suffer in silence. Many times the victims, what they feel is that, you know, it's my fault. I, I, I'm to be blamed. And then we don't speak. So you need to speak, you need to address the problem. If, if you don't speak, you suffer in silence and you continue to face the abuse. And no human being, no human being has the right to abuse someone else and no human being has the right to be abused. No human being has the right to be abused. So this is, the t this is so disgraceful that it's not only disgraceful in terms of humanity, it's also against the tenets and the teachings of Islam. So, so uh, I just want to mention a few websites for those who want to look into this a little more or those who may be perpetrating or being victims. Peacefulfamilies.org These are all Muslim organizations. Peacefulfamilies.org Another website, Project Sakina. And I want some of you to go back and, and get onto this website. ProjectSakina.org There's a list of victims and they're expressing their, their stories as what kind of abuse they're facing. Obviously their identities are concealed. So you see all the resources and what can be done and how one can stop abuse. One local organization, Islamic Social Services Association, issaservices.com. So again, these websites, peacefulfamilies.org, projectsakina.org, issaservices.com. Get help, whether you're the abuser or whether... Uh, you are a victim. And finally, we all need to make a pledge. We all need to make a commitment. The Prophet ﷺ asked for a commitment from the Sahaba before he passed away. He said, will you not take this message to those who are not present? So we need to make a pledge. And that's why I'm wearing this white ribbon here. I've made the pledge. We all need to make a pledge that I will never commit or condone or even remain silent when I see violence against women or girls. We need to make that commitment firstly to Allah. And secondly, go on this website, Muslims for the White Ribbon, MuslimsforWhiteRibbon.com and enter your name there that you are making the pledge as well, that you'll never commit violence against women. And if you see violence against women and girls, you'll always stand up and do something about it. When we do this, then at least we can say we've done something. We've done something. We've created awareness. We've taken some step. Let me conclude with one small story here. Uh, a brother that I know very close to me. I didn't even know. He mentioned to me that, you know what? I was abusing my wife for the last five years. And he told me I would even throw the plate on, his, on her face. Literally. And he mentioned that the cycle broke 
when she one time had the courage to tell someone else. She told someone else, and I was really upset at that time, that, you know, you've ashamed us, etc. But over time, we went and took counseling. We met with our imams. I, I, I took anger management classes. And our situation changed for the better. And I'm so thankful she, that she broke the silence. That today I'm a better person. That I don't abuse my wife anymore. I don't speak roughly and, and harshly. It's just I realized that I was so frustrated. I was under so much stress. And I was taking out the stress in an inappropriate way. So let us remind ourselves that this is something that is against Islam. Domestic abuse, domestic violence, violence against women is against Islam. It's not in accordance to the vision that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to create. He wanted to see peaceful families. He wanted to see peaceful, kind communities. So we need to be those who establish this kindness by recognizing the wrong as wrong. And then if we are perpetrators or victims, we need to get help. Tell others, get help, get counseling, so many agencies and organizations. And finally, make a pledge that we'll never ever commit this kind of violence and we'll always be peaceful and gentle people. We make dua that Allah bless us with kindness and goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the understanding of establishing peaceful communities. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our families upright and responsible. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the success of this world and the hereafter. Amin wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillah rabbil alameen.